able to take one of these slices, work it through our entire system, cool the slice down to minus 180 degrees Celsius, warm it back up to room temperature, and then place it on that multi-electrode array. We saw something that at first I didn't even believe this had worked. So at Cradle, we work to pause biological time so you can get a cure for your disease. Basically, if you can just stop the motion of all the molecules in your body, you can give yourself enough time to make it to the point where your disease might be cured. It actually stays static, not just for years or decades or even centuries, but millennia. So that is cryo sleep. That is like cryo sleep, yeah, but coming back afterwards is, I guess, a critical component of it. So I think one thing I really care about emphasizing is that there's a lot of technical risk that's still here. And so what we don't want to say is that like, you know, there's some like master plan that completely solves this problem. What we do think though, is that unlike many problems that are, you know, huge if solved, but kind of no one's working on, this one is very technically tractable from an engineering and physics perspective. So you can make very fast progress in specific metrics of viability and functionality with samples in a way that is, I think, just encouragingly linked to engineering and physics. This is a technology that is meaningful to me and is personal to me. In 2016, my father-in-law was diagnosed with a terminal case of cancer and we knew that frontline therapies would at best buy him a few months. I remember sitting in the room as a scientist and being angry. How was it possible that this was the full toolkit that science had given us to be able to treat this person's terminal disease? A few months after my father-in-law died, Keytruda came online as a potential therapy for his disease. And it would have given us, instead of a few months, a median expectation of years and would have taken the possibility of complete remission from a distant, not going to happen possibility to like a real chance. I left that experience pretty depressed about the power of science to affect real change in biotechnology. Sure, there was beautiful cures that were coming online every day, but that was cold comfort to people who didn't have access to them or to their families. And then I met Laura. So my background's in longevity tech. In that field, it's all about finding scientific questions that sound totally crazy, but you can find a nugget of tractability to them and then work on kind of making real products. And I'd always heard about cryo and I always just thought, oh, this field will never you know, work, this doesn't make any sense. Until one day I realized that actually I was the victim of the thing that I'm always so annoyed when it happens, which is when you believe that something's not possible because it's like just everyone says it's not possible, but you don't really check it yourself. Traditional cryobiologists decide to kind of stop working on things like neuropreservation or whole body cryopreservation, but it meant that technology like um, doing whole body reversible cryo, where you actually show the whole cycle works, was kind of um, stopped. There's a real social reason why the field stopped working on this kind of general area. She introduced me to a problem that at first I thought was insane, that you would be able to pause biological time, stop all the molecular events inside of the body, and then restart them on demand. I told her as much that I thought that this didn't seem tractable, and I took a few days away and realized that that response wasn't scientific, it was social, and that this is exactly the kind of problem that I've been looking for. One that could unlock a completely different kind of tool for the medical toolkit that's going to get applied to patients with terminal diseases. So the long-term goal is, let's say you're a 20-year-old cancer patient and you get a terminal diagnosis. We want to make a technology that would allow you to make it to the future when you might have a cure for your disease. And this isn't just for the future, there's also a bunch of intermediate uh, products that we're really interested in. Um, for example, cryopreserving organs to help uh, match for patients in transplant, um, and also cryopreserving brain tissue for research use. All right, so where in the world are we, and what are you guys doing here? So we're in South San Francisco, and we're working on reversible cryopreservation of biological systems. So that is cryo sleep. That is like cryo sleep, yeah, but coming back afterwards is, I guess, a critical component of it. And to solve that problem, you have to really think of it in multiple length scales. Basically, what you want to do is you want to take all the molecules inside of your cells, which are constantly moving when you're at room temperature. You want to take all that and you want to be able to press pause and stop everything. In order to do that, you have to cool the system very quickly down to about minus 150 degrees Celsius. As you're cooling down below the freezing point of water, like what happens? Well, water goes from a liquid state into a solid. That solid is ice. 
and ice will damage cells. It turns out that though, if you cool fast enough and you get down to minus 150 degrees Celsius, ice won't form anymore. Basically, you've slowed down molecular motion to the point that water itself isn't moving, and these water molecules that are sort of like diffusing around, instead of being able to slowly order themselves into ice and damage the cells, they get stuck, and they can't form those high energy bonds that will eventually damage the cell membranes. You might imagine like, oh, if I just stop the motion of all the atoms in a cell and then restart it, like that's just gonna totally destroy a bunch of interesting information. But actually we just do this all the time. Like we cryopreserve cells. We actually cryopreserve human embryos regularly in the IVF process. And there are people who were born as twins at the exact same time that are now decades apart in age because they were rewarmed at different times, um, but they were cryopreserved, um, you know, for let's say decades. Welcome to Cryophysics 101. Normally you're operating up here at near 37 degrees Celsius. Let's say that there's something that goes wrong and we need to really slow down your metabolism. Well, there are already medical technologies that allow you to take your metabolic rate and drop it down to four degrees. For cryopreservation though, we're not looking to just like slow molecular motion. We want it to be completely arrested. And to do that, you're gonna have to cool past four degrees Celsius. You actually have to cool all the way down to about minus 130 degrees Celsius where all molecular motion has stopped. Issue is, as you go down below zero degrees Celsius, you're below the freezing point of water. So ice starts to form. So you wanna go from this sort of like zero degrees Celsius area down to minus 130 degrees Celsius as fast as possible. How fast? Well, inside of this danger zone, the peak nucleation rate for ice is 10 to the 23 ice nuclei per cubic centimeter per second. So very fast. The molecular additives that we're putting into the tissue can slow this down, but you still wanna go down as quickly as possible. If you wanna look at this quantitatively, the number of nuclei that you're going to get is equal to the amount of time that you spend cooling multiplied by a constant times the molecular motion of water, the diffusion constant times this exponential, which has in the exp exponent, the energy required to form ice. But it turns out that if you start actually right here in this component of the lab, you can start to change those kinetics. We can develop molecular additives that slow the nucleation rate of ice and allow us to cool down to the point that molecular motion is completely arrested and the biology is basically safe from the damage of potential ice formation and also the deleterious effects of you know, metabolism running in hypothermic conditions. In a former life, I was an academic, and when I took an informal poll before I left the neuroscience lab that I was working at previously, and sort of asked around like, hey, does anybody think this is going to work? Literally no one raised their hand and said that this was going to be possible. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons I think that were guiding that intuition for them. One is these systems are incredibly delicate. Neurons are really finicky and they don't like you adding different chemicals to them. And the other is just like mechanically, the idea of taking a system that is thought of as being really delicate, like a neural microcircuit, cooling it all the way down to minus 180 degrees Celsius and then warming it back up kind of breaks the mind of someone who's used to taking very careful and like gentle care of these tissues. So it's a really hard challenge for us to go for for our first milestone. February 13th of this year was a really special day for us at the company. I feel a little embarrassing, but I was taking my first power vacation in the company history. I told Hunter, hey, like, call me if anything like really terrible happens. And so I was sitting down in this like lobby of this hotel. I see Hunter's name on my phone and I was like, damn it, I pick up the phone and it's like him and the whole team on the phone. Hey, we just got spikes. We were able to take one of these slices, work it through our entire system, cool the slice down to minus 180 degrees Celsius, warm it back up to room temperature, and then place it on that multi-electrode array. We saw something that at first I didn't even believe, which was that this had worked. We were seeing this electrical activity, and I'm actually like standing around the lab, looking at everybody, telling people like, don't get excited, we need to verify that this is real. And we're seeing these little spikes that are showing up on the screen. And then we added the like sort of like final component, which is a component called tetrodotoxin to the slice, which should completely eliminate spiking. So if this was an electrical signal that was just random noise, it would have persisted. But sure enough, we added TTX to the system and these neurons that were happily firing stopped. And uh, it was crazy. It was, we were all jumping up and down, uh, like shouting. We went and ran around the parking lot of our little business park here. I literally screamed and it was like running around this hotel lobby. And this guy comes by and he was like, are you okay? And I was like, no. <laughs> we realized that this was like a first, like this was a moment where we had reversibly cryopreserved a piece of neural tissue and showed that these neurons could like return to their normal function. It was just really exciting that we just got the result and like really quickly too, when we started working on it. 
The system that we're working with here is slices of neural tissue. So you take a brain and you partition it into these tiny 350 micron slices. After you have those thin slices, you can take them and place them onto these multi-electrode arrays. These are 4,000 electrode silicon microarrays that allow us to measure the electrical activity of neurons inside of our little tissue sample, measuring the electrical health of the system. We started with neural tissue because honestly, we thought that it was going to be the hardest. And it's the thing that we all care about. We want to be able to reversibly prior preserve the thing that makes us, us. A critical component of that is being able to measure the electrical activity after cryopreservation. One thing that we're trying to assay here is, is it possible to take a piece of neural tissue, cool it all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperature, warm it back up, and then see that those neurons are behaving as they're supposed to, returning to their like normal electrical function. We had been actually struggling to try to do this for months, and one of the things that we couldn't figure out was how are we gonna cool and reheat fast enough? Particularly the heating had presented a problem. One night I had gone home and I was sitting actually rocking my infants to bed. And for anybody who has had to do this before, it can be kind of a mind numbing process. You're sitting in there, it's dark, it's kind of quiet. And then I had this moment of realization that, oh, I could apply actually something that I worked on before, which was magnetic heating to the system to get really fast heating rates. Um, so I pulled out my phone, I texted two of our engineers who were still here and said, don't leave the lab. We came in and that night actually built the V0 prototype of the system and showed that we could hit the cooling and heating rates that we expected would be necessary to be able to recover electrical function from these systems. And sure enough, when we finalized it and got it to the point that we could get a slice in there, we were able to recover electrical activity. Over here, we have the slice cryopreservation system. It basically takes a slice of tissue, brain tissue in our case, and cryopreserves it, rewarms it. And what it does is flows liquid nitrogen at a really high flow rate over the top and the bottom of the slice, cooling it down to liquid nitrogen temperature in like a few seconds. And then you stay there as long as you want to remain cryopreserved. Theoretically, you could stay there for tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of years if you wanted to. Uh, we tend to do it for about a minute. Uh, and then we warm it up with this really fancy machine over here, an alternating magnetic field generator, and that's where this coil comes in. What happens when you put metal in an alternating magnetic field, it gets really hot really quickly and warms your tissue extremely quickly. The reason you want to do that, as Humphrey talked about, is you want to avoid this danger zone here in temperature between zero C and whatever your glass transition temperature is. And so you want to spend as little time in that zone as you possibly can. Hence the liquid nitrogen and alternating magnetic field on a piece of metal cooling and warming very extremely. That's it. Yeah, there was a brain in there. There's a brain in there. Yes. So this is the dramatic part where we actually do the, it's called vitrification, which is turning biological sample into glass. Liquid nitrogen vaporizes super easily. And so this is nitrogen vapor filling up the fridge that we have this in. Uh, and when we're ready to warm, we're gonna immediately shut this off and turn on that magnetic field coil. So as you can see down here on this x-axis is the temperature that we're cooling a system towards. And you can see that as you take this sample that we're measuring here and you cool it along this line down below zero degrees Celsius. Like I said before, the water doesn't immediately turn into ice. But at a certain point, you get this big peak, and that's the peak of ice forming. You can use this peak to try to study basically how much energy did it take for the water to turn from its liquid state into an ice state. We then cool all the way down to minus 180 degrees, warm back up, and then you see at about zero degrees, that solid icy substance comes back into liquid, and you see a peak basically in the opposite direction as you go from that uh, solid state back into the liquid state. I'm gonna start the cooling process right now. So now that we've cryopreserved our slice of brain. We're gonna warm it up really quickly using our magnetic field. So I'm gonna start that. You'll hear this come on in a sec. That's the field. That's the line of the- uh, Of the tensor. That's it heating up. Yep. Wow. Now we're back at zero C. And we're fast. Yeah. And we're gonna hold that. Oh my God. The electrical contacts on the bottom of this well be basically reading the voltage from the slice where it's in direct contact. 
Right now, what you can see on the screen is basically a 2D map of the array that's right underneath the brain slice. If we're looking for viability after cryopreservation, we would want to see some level of baseline activity, but after this baseline recording, we'll also stimulate it with a lot of kind of basically stimulant drugs to get the activity to fire up. The color in each of these pixels represents kind of how active that location on the array might be. This region here is like suspicious. That might be some spiking. So a good sign you're starting to see a region that might be active. We wash the drugs on. We'll hope to see more. All right, so now we have stimulant drugs running over our vitrified slice. So the spikes that you see here on the computer are traces from the brain slice showing electrical activity. This is kind of the amazing thing that we've been able to show that you can actually preserve a brain slice and maintain the ability to produce these electrical signals. So if these are true biological spikes and not just noise produced by whatever um, component of the hardware here, then we should be able to block it with tetrodotoxin. So now that tetrodotoxin is washing over the slice, you actually see that the electrical signals that we were seeing were indeed blocked. So we're convinced that those are true biological spikes in um, the slice that we vitrified with our system. It's surreal to see that. It is, it very much so, <laughs> yeah. So the next milestone we're aiming to hit is to show that you can um, preserve memory in a slice of brain tissue that's been cryopreserved and rewarmed. And the milestone after that is to show you can cryopreserve and rewarm a whole brain uh, while uh, maintaining long-range electrical connectivity um, between uh, certain sets of neurons. Sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think there's something really beautiful about how general this technology is. You know, for any disease you get where there's possibly a cure in the future, if we could really solve this whole problem, um, this technology is relevant to that. And so it just makes me feel really excited about the um, potential ability to impact a lot of patients um, if you solve this one technical problem along the way. One thing that I'm really excited about is like, what does this unlock for humans to reach out and go to the deepest parts of the cosmos? As always, sci-fi got ahead of us here and has predicted for a long time that you would need something like hypersleep to get out to the deepest reaches of the universe. And I'm super excited to be working on technology that might make that possible. We really don't want to say this is a solved problem or that there are no risks left, but it's sort of a problem that's so compellingly linked to many deep domains of physics. And, and so uniquely, I, I come from working biotech and just, you know, you're trying to make like a small molecule cure Alzheimer's. It's like it's just many like things that are, I think, and many like a lot harder in, in many senses than being able to use like the full power of engineering and physics and chemistry and biology to address this one problem. 